Today we're talking about the impact of what we did in Saigaya. Um, as we discussed yesterday, perhaps about halfway through the project, we thought, well, uh, one of the issues with science gateways and e-infrastructure is that they mean a lot to us, they mean a lot to people who have been involved in that research, but to people outside of the field, it can be quite opaque. So what can these things do for everybody? So we spent a lot of time thinking about how we could deliver value to African end users, African scientists. Um, round about that time, um, we started looking more and more into open science. There was an OECD report um, generated last year, uh, sorry, the year before last, and of course there's the open science movement. And what we thought within the project is, well, surely what we should be doing is trying to help African scientists to make the output of their research visible on the world stage. And that is exactly aligned with what open science is trying to achieve. So we reconceptualized what we were trying to do. In other words, how can we energize science in Africa using ICT? The answer is, well, we embrace open science and do everything in that context. So um, we created the Open Science Co uh, Platform and Commons, and that reflects research efforts that's ongoing throughout the world in trying to bring, bring together an integrated tool and suite of tools for collaboration. We trained people on that, and as we discussed yesterday, and as we will discuss today, the e-research hack fests that takes the output of our educational materials and works with stakeholders to create new services and new science gateways and new infrastructures in a virtuous circle so that the more people we train, the more services we create, the more training materials we create, which means the more people we train and the more services we create, etc. And right at the heart of that are the community of practice champions that we celebrated yesterday in the user forum. And we have two or three of those talks today. Um, repeated because yesterday we introduced some, some very, very exciting concepts and today we'd like to dig into them in a little bit more depth. But um, if you take yesterday as a sample of what we've achieved in this project, um, one might take a step back and say, wow, but what have you really done? So what I thought would be good today is just to take a, a little bit of time this morning just to try and conceptualize and place what we've done in the, in the context of open science. So, open science is coming. Um, in Europe, there is a, a discussion about whether or not open science is the right way to go. However, the decision has been taken out of our hands, which is rather nice. Um, if one funds a project, so if my government funds a research project, it is entirely plausible for that government to expect that the output of that project to be openly accessible by the citizens of that country and beyond. And with that simple phrase, um, Research Councils UK, Horizon 2020 with the European Commission, and the National Science Foundation of the States have all come out with the same statements to say, if we fund your research, the outputs of your research must be publicly accessible. Which is great, because now suddenly, many, many researchers are saying, we're all open scientists, which is great for everybody. And it's particularly great in Africa because certainly as we met people in our projects and certainly with the research endeavor we've been pursuing for 10 years or so, um, for African scientists, the idea of open science is obvious, but the mechanism to deliver it is often missing. And this is where we've tried within this project to move things a little bit further forward. Open science is extremely broad. There's no official definition of what open science is, but there's plenty of things written about it. And FOSTER, which is a project in Europe which is pushing open science, has developed this taxonomy, which is far too small to read. But when you come back and look over these slides, there's some lots of interesting concepts. And I've looked at this and I asked myself the question, can I add anything in there that's not, which is missing? And the answer really is not really. It's a comprehensive taxonomy of what we mean by open science. Now, in that frame, 
let me present a short presentation, which we've done several times in this project, which demonstrates the concept of open science to um, academia. So we um, created um, uh, a research project, a mini research project within our initiative um, to develop an infection model. So where I come from, I lead a small but very, very productive uh, research group called the Modeling and Simulation Group. We built simulations for all sorts of stakeholders in all sorts of areas, ranging from healthcare to defense to manufacturing um, everywhere. So we thought, well, we'll create a small simulation and then use that to demonstrate how an academic might embrace open science. So this is the agent-based simulation of an infection network. Later today, Anna Cecilia, a colleague of mine, will talk more about um, the actual simulation that was developed there. But basically, a lot of the work was done by Adi, who's the, the middle author from Nigeria, a PhD student of mine, uh, and Anna Cecilia, and we were supported wonderfully by Roberto and his team, Marion Rita, and Bruce, of course. So this is the model, and just very simply, um, we pretend in this context that uh, as scientists or a team of scientists have decided to study the spread of infection. So um, let's say I <coughs> have a cold, I come into this uh, um, wonderful body of people and I generously infect everybody with my cold. You then go home and you do the same to your friends and you do the same and you do the same and you do the same. So the question is with agent zero here, um, how quickly can I infect a population with my cold? Now, it's just a test model, um, and it's just there to demonstrate um, the spread of disease, which is an important topic in Africa. But the basic idea is I, as a scientist, have created some software, and I have used that to investigate a research area. I have had some results from that, and I would like to publish them in a paper. Now, what normally happens is I publish the paper, I publish a description of uh, the model in the paper, some results, and the next person, let's say Bruce, is interested in it, picks that up, tries to reproduce the results in the paper, and can't do anything because he can't access the software, or perhaps I've created the software in such a way that he doesn't have the IT skills to deploy and use that software, although in Bruce's context, that's highly unlikely. Um, the results have gen gen generated are very often poorly described in research papers, certainly with the input data. I can't access the input data to reproduce the experiments, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, although that paper may be in itself open for people to access, the artifacts within that paper are not open. So what I'm going to show you now is one view of how you might open up and unpack uh, the research within a paper. So. What does a paper consist of? Now, this case study, and this is pretty much the same in a lot of scientific research, is that I might have some software, in this case, a model and simulation, some language or package. I might have some input data and then some data within the model, in this case, parameters. I then have the results and the experimental parameters I use to generate those results. I have the scientific paper um, with acknowledgements to funders, etc. And there's many more things in there that I might have. Now, just pausing, um, we need to understand what we mean by uniqueness. So when I publish a paper, it's entirely possible that through the publication process, there might be several copies of that paper available online through various digital libraries. However, there's only one paper. Now, citing that paper and gaining credit from that citation in the past has been very difficult. But now what we can do is assign a digital object identifier that's been made possible by data sites to that paper, which means we can start uniquely and digitally awarding credit to citations of people citing that paper. Importantly, it's a persistent identifier. I can store that paper anywhere. I can do anything I like to that paper. But the fact is, there's one single web-based reference that I can click on. It's resolved somewhere. We're not bothered about where it's resolved. It just happens. And I'm taken to the definitive copy of that paper. In other words, it makes it discoverable and searchable, which is extremely important for raising the profile of research. 
Personally, I have published in conferences that don't use DOIs. When you try and find the paper that you published yourself, it's sometimes almost impossible. With this, we have a very simple and systematic way of identifying a paper and the researcher associated with it. So, well, is it that easy? Well, until recently, it's not been that easy, but now it is because now we have unique identifiers for people. So there's the digital equivalent of me online, which is that. I answer to Simon Taylor, or alternatively, 000-001, etc. That's my ORCID ID. You can get an ORCID ID in about a minute. It's that easy. There's several million of these. Many, many funding agencies require that you have an ORCID ID, so they've got your exact details. Many journals now require that you have an ORCID ID. There seems to be some debate about whether or not this is an ethical thing to do. Uh, for me, as a computer scientist, it's a no-brainer because there's a unique Simon Taylor. And if you Google Simon Taylor, there are a lot of Simon Taylors in the world. And it's very difficult to establish me as a unique Simon Taylor. Now I have that, I'm unique. And if you want to call me Simon or 0189 informally, I don't mind. So now we publish. Now, as we've given these sort of talks as we go around different events in SciGay, and we've had seven very productive events and lots of presentations at conferences, a theme that seems to come back is, what do we need by, mean by open access publishing to a journal paper? And just to dwell on this for a moment, there's sort of three options, and then there's hybrids of this. There's, taking these slides out of order from the slide, there's gold open access. So I publish a paper in a journal, and I pay that journal to make it open. Now, there's a little bit of a myth about this payment. So many people see this payment as a barrier to open access publishing, and it can be perceived that way. But in many cases, that fee is the beginning of a negotiation. And I've had discussions with publishers that say, well, if somebody's publishing in a journal that offers gold open access, and that person is coming from a university or a country that doesn't really have the money for that, then some deal can be struck. But the important thing is to engage the editor of the journal and the publisher in that process early on so everybody knows what's expected. Now, alternatively, there's green open access publishing. So I publish something in the Journal of the Operational Research Society, which is an, a, a journal I publish in um, fairly often. It's based in the UK. It's an international journal with an impact factor. And it does offer gold open access, but it's very costly. So green instead is after an embargo period has lifted, I can have the last version of that paper in my open access repository at Brunel, freely accessible to anybody who wants a copy. So the idea is somebody searches and finds your journal paper, you'll be able to get um, not the final version of the journal paper, but the, the pre-proof available from an open access repository, which is great, which means anybody can publish in a journal openly. There are mechanisms. Now, the problem in many African institutions is there's no open access repository. And in our project, we have software and a package that we can deliver to any university to do this. So any university has the capability now of hosting an open access repository and importantly awarding DOIs to anything deposited in that repository. And that is particularly important if you are depositing data and other artifacts of research also. So that's one great success that we've delivered in SciGo. Then we have the rare exception. I publish lots of papers in modeling and simulation. And my main conference, the Winter Simulation Conference, has an open archive. But I'm very lucky that I have that. There's many other academic disciplines that don't. So a publication has a DOI. You can link this to your ORCID ID. And then there's a whole separate discussion about how to get published that's available from our sixth conference, uh, six workshop, if you want to have a look. So anyway, have a concept paper. Uh, this is published. Um, how do we address openness in this? Well, the starting point is every artifact in this paper has been published openly. And we've done that by associating the artifact with a DOI and putting it in an open access repository. 
What's not included in this talk, because it happened after we've done this exercise, is the Zenodo link from GitHub, which means I can, I, I can put a DOI on my software pointing to GitHub, which means anybody can then download the software from GitHub rather than anything else. And that's quite good because GitHub gives you plenty of other um, bonuses around that, including software documentation, collaboration, etc. So that's the example from the paper. As you can see, the blue highlighted links are the DOI links to an open access repository. In, in this case, it's the one supported by our project for, well, let's go down the list. The first one is a DOI package. So it's all the artifacts of the research in one easily accessible link. So I could just have that in the paper, but I wanted to unpack that so people can see what's in there. I then have a link to the software. Now, there's several versions of the software we can have in this. I can have a link to the original source code. I can have a link to a virtual machine that you just have to download and run in a virtual box to run and access the source code. That means you don't have to be an expert. Or I can have a link to a science gateway that I can talk about in a moment. But then the other links are the experimental results from running different experiments each one of these has the experimental parameters in there. So basically, anybody who gets that paper can just very easily click on those links and download all the artifacts of my research in this published paper. And I don't really need to go on because it's that simple. Okay, and now I've done this, I go around colleagues in my department saying, why aren't you doing the same? They say it must be very complicated. And then five minutes later, they say, oh, it's not. So it's something we can all embrace very, very quickly. Now, open access repository, that's the actual uh, rec record of the DOI collection. Um, it's, that's the uh, context of the DOI collection. Um, and actually doing that, uh, there was a longer uh, example of that yesterday in Roberto's talk. Um, it's simplicity itself just to deposit something in there. And there are other open access technologies available. Brunel uses Figshare. My university uses Figshare, rather. Uh, and there are others, but this one, um, it's done an open source technology. I say, so if, if you're interested, you could actually get it this morning, and if you have the right machine and permissions, you could have that up and running by the end of today. Now, I want to make my software accessible, and I want to make it accessibly, accessible easily to a scientist. So yes, I have deployed the artifacts of my research so people can download and run them, but many science, scientist colleagues of mine uh, would stumble probably to get a virtual machine up and running, which is fair enough. You know, why would I expect a biologist to know how to run a virtual machine? So instead, and we saw two excellent examples yesterday, in fact, to be honest, we saw many excellent examples yesterday of science gateways, what I can do is I can deploy my software onto an e-infrastructure and have that software accessed through a web-based interface called a Science Gateway. And this is the example here. So this is the Africa Grid Science Gateway. My software is loaded up onto that. And in this case, thanks to Marion Reese for um, making that possible, um, which means I now very easily can do the following with the scientist. The scientist logs on. Now, this uses federated identity, which basically means it's a scalable, global way of you logging onto a globally accessible system. In other words, I don't have to go to a university and get permission. I go to my national identity provider to get permission, which is a far more scalable um, and future-proof way of doing things. So I log in. I go back now. I use the menus to pick my software pretty fast. Um, I fill in the form. I press go. I get the results. Now, that couldn't be easier. And we've been working with stakeholders in e-research hackfests to deploy this. And the two best paper uh, winners, the two best fully-fledged science gateways that we've built to the project so far. But that's the experience for the end users. So when we talk about science gateways and e-infrastructures, what we're basically saying is, I want to make my software available as easily as possible to the end user, because oddly enough, I want people to use it. And there's plenty of examples across the world where that hasn't happened. But now it's easy to do this using all the educational materials that we've created in the project and all the materials behind me on this slide because it's all open source and it's all freely available. 
And we've just got another tool in there so you can graphically visualize, um, in this case, uh, an infection outbreak. So last but not least, access to scientists. This is my ORCID record. Um, and the um, entry, the top two entries are the two conference papers that were published on this. So I'm now linked into the system. And then, well, I was going to finish there, but there was some talk yesterday about credit for scientific papers. So just very quickly, um, I don't know how many people know about scientific uh, metrics for the scientist, but there's two types. There's scientific metrics and there's alt metrics, which is the new sort of social media version. The leading metric for scientific metrics is this thing called a H-index. It's measured by when one scientist publishes N articles and gets cited N times. A H-index of N results gets et cetera, et cetera, credit. And what we've got here is, I've just put this up out of interest because this is a, a survey of UK universities. Um, Brunel, my university is here. This is Oxford and Cambridge. This is the number of citations per person. And this is the number of academic scholars. So you can see Oxford and Cambridge, virtually everybody is having their work cited 5,000 times and above. So it's a logarithmic scale. And that's kind of what you would expect from the top universities. My university, Brunel, it's, it's a good university, but we have a long tail of researchers who are seeking to have their scholarly work uh, more widely visible. Um, I'm here, so I've got about 2,000 career citations. I'm very pleased to say the mean of computer science is 23, and my H-index is 23. So I'm a mean computer scientist. But the point is, you get credit, but you only get credit if your work is searchable and linkable through DOIs, through Crossref, which is a little technology in there, and now with ORCID. We then have alt metrics, and this I'm using myself as the example here. This is an article we published from EI for Africa, the last, peg, uh, the last project. It's a study on the state of the art of infrastructure uptake in Africa. And the metrics for this, this is alt metrics, this is social media metrics. I have a metric of 13. Now, you don't know what the scale is. The top scale in alt metrics is several thousand, but that score places me um, in the top 10% of research outputs made by alt metric. So you can, the, the take home message from this is you don't have to have a big score to go a long way in alt metrics, but this will now start building on an annual basis. And this is calculated from mentions in Wikipedia, Facebook, Twitter, etc., which are all technologies widely used in Africa and could be, if the right campaign is adopted, widely used to raise the alt metrics score. And alt metrics is starting to be used more and more in judging whether or not a research paper is interesting to society because people are talking about the output of your research. I have lots of research that has zero because nobody talks about that apart from myself and Anastasia, and we're always very excited about what we do. And then last of all, there's various tools that are appearing. This is Impact Story, and again, I offer myself up as an example. It's a bit of fun, but again, it's starting to raise an importance. It's how can you judge the impact of my research? Now, interestingly, I was quite surprised at this. Despite the fact I'm sort of new to open science, my research output, 65% of my research output is free to access. And I found that out in minutes of signing up to an impact story. And there's various other things that, in, that you get in there. For some reason, my research is widely discussed in Japan. I don't know why, but it was a nice thing to find out. Now, where this is going, this is, I say this is just a bit of fun, um, I don't know, but it's ways of understanding how your research is being used across the world. And one of the things we're trying to do in Impact Story is to say that, yes, you have badges and awards for being highly cited in Japan or Germany or wherever, but let's have that in Africa as well. So we're campaigning to have individual African countries identified as well. So thank you very much for that. To summarize, open science is what we should be doing to raise awareness of our research and to make our research accessible and reproducible. Open access publishing is easy to do, but it's often difficult to start because many people don't know where, how to get started. And I hope this overview has given some insight into that process. 
Size gateways can ease access to software for non-experts, and this is very, very, very important. And then finally, we've got the unique ID through ORCID, which means we're uniquely identifiable. But then, how do we get people started? And this is one of the greatest pleasures in this project. It's by the eResearch Hackfest. And that's generated the 35 champions, of which some are here today, and we'll speak later. So thank you very much.